Welcome to the virtual Vilna. It's time for another evening of Lifesavers. Our mission is to share with you the personal stories of amazing people. I am Jason Weiner, and my wife, Nicole Zallen, and I are proud to sponsor the Lifesavers Speakers Series. Before we start, just a few words about the Vilna. The Vilna was built by immigrants from Lithuania in 1919. I mentioned this year, not just because we are proud of our restored 101 year old building, but because the Vilna was built during another pandemic, the Spanish flu, an interesting historical parallel. While the building was originally a place of worship, today we are a cultural center, a hub of activity to engage people in Jewish culture, spirituality, learning, food, music, movies, language, and much more located in the heart of Beacon Hill. Also, I wanna send a big welcome to the Vilna's new executive director, Dalit Bellin Horn. Tonight, we are going to listen and learn from two incredible doctors who have been fighting the pandemic at Boston's Mass General Hospital. Here's how tonight will work. I will facilitate a conversation with Dr. Mark Poznanski and Dr. Paul Courier. We will leave time for audience Q&A. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. The, the full bios for each speaker will be pasted into the chat. Briefly, um, Dr. Mark Poznanski is a scientist and a practicing physician at MGH. Dr. Paul Courier is an intensive care and pulmonary physician and also at MGH. You will learn a lot about these two amazing doctors tonight. Okay, welcome to Lifesavers, doctors. Can we bring up, can we bring up Mark and Paul now? Great. Hopefully the three of us are on camera. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. Paul. Hi, Jason. Let's start with Mark. Mark, you run the vaccine an immunization center at MGH, also called the VIC. You are a practicing physician and a scientist who has furthered the understanding of the immune system, cancer, rare infectious diseases, and immune disorders. Tell us how your training and research prepared you for the onslaught of COVID-19. Well, actually the, 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 the preparation started in a funny way at the age of eight when I realized that uh, diseases were infectious. And I realized that whenever my, my older brother and my younger brother came back with anything from school, I would get whatever they had pretty quickly thereafter. It was only years later that I realized that Hippocrates had spotted that 3000 years ago as well. But the, the story went um, that, that when they came home with chicken pox, I was eight, my older brother was 11, my young brother was seven, and they had spots. I instantly locked them in their room. So I let them go into their room to do their homework and I locked the door behind them and left them in there. And a few hours later when my parents came home from work, and this is in a different time and a different place, uh, London in the 1970s, they were like, where are, where are your brothers? And I said, I put them in quarantine. Every time they come home with spots, I get spots. I don't want spots this time. I don't want to get it. And they said, well, you can't lock your brothers up for the next two weeks or 40 days in that room without looking after them. Well, flash forward, like a lot of stories, you know, we, we approach the things we fear most often in, in our work. And I end up as an infectious diseases physician, practicing for the first time after medical school in Edinburgh, when all 2000 IV drug users seroconverted to HIV, in other words, became HIV infected. This is about 1984 uh, with HIV, basically. And as a junior doctor, hundreds of patients were coming into the hospital, which was the main hospital in Edinburgh, which is in Scotland, with a new condition that we just had no idea. We'd been through medical school and we were literally, every level of doctor and every nurse knew, had no idea what was happening to these patients. And we were doing our best with very little uh, uh, directed therapy. We just 
sort of were trying to patch together treatment. And then that was very much a, a sort of baptism by fire for dealing with a new pandemic at the very beginning when the on the in, you know incoming patients were completely incomprehensible in terms of what they were suffering from. Mm -hmm. And I think that there were many uh, echoes in the experience when I first went onto the ICUs to be of, of help to the brilliant ICU doctors like Paul, that we didn't know exactly in that first wave what precisely was happening. And we were doing our best to save as many lives as we possibly could and get people back to their normal lives thereafter. And it, 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 it's, it's both times it was equally shocking. I can tell you there was, it, it, didn't, it didn't get any less shocking, but it did prepare me for the sort of mindset that's needed to deal with a pandemic where the disease in the initial phase is completely unknown. Mm. In the early days, uh, Mark, how, how did you split your time between research that was supporting the effort to develop a vaccine and other diagnostics and actually in the ICU treating patients? So during that time, I was called on to do more clinical work or there's more clinical work to be done. And so I would have said that I was on pretty much two weeks each month for those first few months, on two weeks and then off two weeks. Um, and uh, as I said, helping in the ICUs to guide the directors of the ICUs like Paul to manage the infectious disease that was now rampant amongst patients who were there. And I'm talking about advice because Paul was absolutely on the front line. The nurses in the ICU were absolutely on the front line. Infectious diseases doctors are sort of consultants and advisors in that context. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's that's. I, we, we were gonna let's get let's use that as a, as an opportunity to bring Paul into the conversation. So Paul. As Actually, can I just say too that to, to say that Mark was not frontline and, and all his <laughs> colleagues is, is definitely not true as the first thing. And, uh, and, and I will say in terms of uh, just something else that Mark said about the unknown, I think one aspect of this pandemic for me that has been really just impactful is just thinking about the fact that, uh, and Jason, you and I were talking about this a little bit recently, this idea that anything in life is really known or certain is just such a uh, such a <laughs> an, it's just not true, right? I mean, we, and, and I think the pandemic has just brought that into focus. And, and but just this idea that we actually understand uh, almost I hate to say this for everybody who's listening, but most of the diseases that we treat or what's going to happen, or that there is certainty in life. I think that's been really just revealed to be untrue. And, and I think the pandemic has that brought that into focus in good ways and bad ways. And that um, that's a, a reality that we don't often pay attention to. And I think it can really just heighten purpose and meaning in life in the context of everything that we're doing. And uh, so I, I think it's it's really interesting, I think, Mark, that you made that comment about uncertainty. Let's, let's, let's delve right into that, that point you made, Mark, I mean, I mean, Paul, about uncertainty. And then I'm gonna do like a little time travel with you. You were at MGH, working in the intensive care unit as a pulmonologist treating patients when the first suspected COVID-19 patient was admitted to the ICU. Um, there's an amazing and captivating New York Times article about you and that first patient. His name is Jim Bello. Take us back to March a year ago and tell us about your experiencing treating Jim Bello. Yeah, so I definitely will. And the first thing I'll say too is that that article, I think, you know, there were a few people who were highlighted in that article. And I think the first point that I'll make is that it truly is the entire village of, in this case, Mass General or any institution or any yeah. uh, group of people who are, are treating any patient that makes a huge difference in, in just how things unfold. And so I think it's, um, I think I'm just very cognizant of the fact that anything that I do or Mark does or anybody 
does is highly dependent on just innumerable people and and operations that exist. Um, and so, and that having been said, I, I think um, it was obviously a very deeply personal time. And at that moment, so this is the beginning of March, and I was looking back, reading through my journal before talking tonight, and uh, just tr remembering some of, of what it was like. And at that moment, actually, when we had our first patient and with COVID in the ICU, we'd actually had four patients who ended up not being positive for COVID. And so there was already this heightened sense of concern. And, and it, was a, it was such a fascinating time because I remember one of our trainees was in the intensive care unit in those early days wearing a mask in the hospital. And I remember thinking, you know, like, what's he doing? Like, yeah, you know, everybody's saying you don't have to wear masks for this disease. Like, why is he wearing a mask? And I remember a bunch of the staff talking to me and saying, can, can you just ask him to stop wearing this mask? Because it's making everybody uncomfortable. And I look and we have some pictures actually of some of the residents, the trainees on our team and nobody was wearing masks. And it was amazing to think back in those early days. And it's just so humbling also to think about how, um, you know, we were so sure that there was no need for yeah. protection for masks like this. And we were so wrong about this. And so such a humbling time. And so there was this, you know, we, we felt like we knew certain things. Again, this, this idea that we have any certainty about things. And then the, um, there was the knowledge that in New York City, there was just this incredible, intense surge of patients that they were struggling to deal with. And it was likely coming to Boston. And then there had been that Biogen conference where there was a, a significant spread here. And so patients were coming and they were getting tested outside in these pods that were set up. And it was, I just remember there being this like intense, just fear of what was going to happen. And, uh, and, so, and so there we were trying to get ready for things without having any idea exactly what we were dealing with. And, and really uh, just, I think, taking a chance also to examine like why we were in medicine in the first place and why this was important. And this idea of um, in good times and bad, actually um, working to try to help people in uh, the context of illness. And, uh, and so I think there was, it was a time of a lot of soul searching early on. And so we were um, there, and I don't know if you want me to continue talking about this, but the, um, um, when uh, we did know that that first patient came into the ICU, um, do you want me to keep going on that thread for a minute? Yeah, that was a dramatic, that was an important event, I imagine, for you. And yeah, her. absolutely. And so, um, so again, we had had a few patients. We thought maybe they had COVID. They didn't. And then uh, one morning I came in and there had been a patient transferred in from another hospital in town. And at that point, it sounded like this was really actually a, a patient who did have COVID and he was very, very sick. And so at this point we said, well, you know, this is, this is probably it, um, but we still didn't know. And as that was happening, though, it was really interesting to just to see again, the heightened awareness and the just attention to detail. And I remember vividly going to, to this patient's room initially and seeing, I was there with one of our resident trainees. So this would be somebody who had just two years ago had just finished medical school and never anticipated that he was gonna be dealing with a pandemic like this. And I remember as we were getting ready to go into this patient's room, there, there was a set of double doors to try to prevent any aerosolization of, of, of COVID coming out of the room. So there were two sets of doors. So you'd go through the first set of doors and there you would do what's called uh, donning or putting on the PPE, the protective equipment. And so you would go and you'd put on um, all the, the material that you'd need. And so you'd put on the gown and the gloves and the mask and eye protection. And I remember seeing the hands of this resident shaking as he was getting ready to put on these gloves because you were getting ready then as the next set of double doors opened to step into this environment where we had no idea just how contagious 
this virus could be. And it was almost, I would, I would liken it to stepping out into outer space in a spacesuit. And this concept that you would hope that the spacesuit was really tight because if it wasn't, maybe you were gonna die. And, and it was that, and you could see that, you could, uh, you could sense that. And at the same time, seeing in the case of this resident, overcoming this fear and you know and I had fear myself certainly too I just have dealt with this more over the years not like this exactly but similar to it and and you could see him overcoming this and it was it's incredible to see you know for somebody like him the kind of courage and I think it was very inspiring to see that among uh, all, just all of the staff that was taking care of, of um, this patient and then subsequent patients just the courage they displayed. And I think that gave me personally a lot of strength and also seeing, boy, you know, if this trainee can do it, I can certainly do it. And I need to set an example for him. And it all kind of, you know, I think we sort of found strength in each other. Mm. And what, just describe how grave the situation was with that first patient who was put on a respirator and later the ECMO machine. Yeah. So, and, and so for, for this patient specifically, um, originally when he came in, he actually started getting better and we actually felt like things were going really well. And then um, very soon thereafter, things took a real turn for the worse. And we then were very, very worried about him. And, uh, and so Things were getting worse. And then we um, did something that is very common in taking care of patients with COVID in the ICU, which is actually um, flipping him, oops, sorry there, on, uh, on his stomach, um, which can sometimes help to improve the oxygen that gets into the body. And so we did that. I remember that vividly one night at 2 a.m. and this is something, it's a practice that we, uh, we actually don't do very often, but now that we've done in, in COVID hundreds and hundreds of times, because it's, it's uh, something that really does seem to be helpful. So this proning of, of patients where we flip them onto their stomach. And I remember at 2 a.m. we were uh, there and I'm just so thankful that um, I think Tom, one of our nurses who's so experienced was on and, and I was thinking like, how are we gonna do this? Cause it's a complicated, it, you know, it's a very simple thing in a way. All you do is you flip somebody onto their stomach, but it's a lot more complicated when there's actually a breathing tube in the mouth that you need to make sure it doesn't get pulled out in the midst of flipping somebody. And there are all these IVs that are in patient's arms that you need to make sure don't come out. And so a whole bunch of people were standing around this patient, getting ready to flip this person and you know, it, it just, it was a, a very dramatic event. And I just remember Tom saying like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. We've got this, no problem. And, and just feeling that again, that village who was there with us helping to uh, do all this work was just, it, it, you just can't describe it. And, and I think, you know, and thinking about the People, yeah, I mean, certainly the physicians play a significant role in this and, uh, you know, but man, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the people in there that who are at the bedside all the time and, you know, risking just so much more exposure than we did. They, they are really the heroes of all of this. And, uh, and so, so a group of nurses and respiratory therapists went and flipped this patient. And at that point, things started looking up again we thought things were really going in the right direction. And I remember going to sleep right after that, that night around 2.30 in the morning, lying down for a couple of hours and saying, ah, oh, you know what? Things were really looking up, we got this. And then I woke up the next morning and things were looking worse again. And then at that point, uh, then once um, flipping somebody over or proning somebody is done, uh, there is really only one step after that that we have. We have a few other tricks, but really the next step after that is, is using this technology that you were talking about called ECMO. And it's a, it's a technology that basically takes blood outside the body and runs it through a machine that provides oxygen and then puts it back into the body. And so what it does is it's an artificial way of supplying oxygen to the body when the lungs can no longer allow for oxygen to get into the blood. 
And it's really, it's, it's a very specialized, very difficult to run technology. And it's something that's only available at very few institutions. And that's then what this patient had to receive in order to be able to keep him alive. All right, everyone, take a deep breath. You've met Dr. Mark Pesnancy, and you've met Dr. Paul Courier, and we're gonna hear a lot more from both of them tonight. But right now, I wanna introduce a special surprise guest, Mr. James Bellow. Can we see Jim's face now, please? Jim, right. it's great to see you fully recovered. It's, it's great good to be seen. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to see you. You look <laughs> awesome. And, I feel uh, good. And, and my, my PTSD was in remission until I heard Paul speak for the last 10 minutes. But <laughs> everything should be just fine. <laughs> we've heard the story. We've heard the first half of the story. Can you tell us your thoughts about being that patient and recovering and being with us tonight? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of thoughts. Uh, you know, you reflect, I guess, you know, when you hear a story like Paul just told, listen, I'm, it's a miracle, you know. Um, I'm blessed to be here. Um, I'm going to get emotional. I didn't think I was. But yeah. it's okay. I'm We're blessed, getting emotional. Blessed to be, you know, due to Paul, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible to hear Paul speak, um, <clears throat> you know, truly how humble he is um, and how how generous he is and, you know, just the tremendous empathy that he shows for, uh, for everyone. And, you know, listen, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't have a ton of memories as I told you, Jason, when we chatted about this, about, you know, what happened when I was at MGH. Um, but, you know, what I take away from it is, you know, how Paul and everybody at MGH treated my family. And uh, it was truly remarkable. I got my wife, Kim, I got my kids who are here and there. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, my memories are few and far between, but what I know, you know, having spoken with Kim and spoken with everybody is just that tremendous sense of uh, compassion and empathy that Paul, and as he said, all of the doctors, all of the nurses, the CNAs, the respiratory therapists, the village that Paul spoke about how good they were to, uh, to my family when they needed it. Yeah. So I'm happy to be here today. That's a long-winded way of saying I'm happy to be here. I can imagine. Yeah. And it, you know, the article, which I, I know Lynn pasted the link, is such a beautiful article written by a Pulitzer Prize winning writer for the New York Times, Pam Bellick, just talks about the incredible teamwork, as Paul mentioned, the incredible support from your family. And uh, the, it just, it's an amazing story. And I guess a very, a very human one, how so many people were pulling for you and they're just so happy today that that you recovered. I mean, it's really a, a very human and uh, inspiring story for sure. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that with us. Pleasure. We're going to come back to Jim at the end where I have two more very important questions for Jim. And now we're going to transition to highlight some of the themes that we've talked about to learn something from, from Mark and Paul. Um, let me go, let me go back to Mark for a second and delve right to the heart of the matter, which I want you to talk about and then we'll hear from Paul about the same, which is when you were walking around the ICU, even though you were prepared to be a doctor when you were eight years old, why, what, what was the role of your fear? How did you go make sure that you weren't overwhelmed by the situation that you found yourself in? What were the, what were the supports that you drew upon internally to make sure that you were able to do the best medicine possible in your role at MGH in such circumstances? Well, obviously, life experience plays a lot of role that, that as I said, the, the, the first experience of the HIV pandemic as a resident, and then this as a, a much more senior physician, uh, the training, uh, the training that you receive, I've been very fortunate to be trained at, you know, very good institutions that prepare you for the worst. Um, I worked in a very busy emergency room as a um, senior resident and fellow in London. In, in we saw everything a bit like some of the famous hospitals in Chicago and New York, and that prepared you. Uh, I'd served in the British Army uh, for three years as a medic, uh, during which time we prepared for nuclear war in Europe and the medical consequences of that, which 
which involved planning for 250,000 casualties in a day. Uh, oh. And so I think training is very important to calm the mind. You feel like you will, you're prepared, you're mentally prepared and trained. And secondly, what Paul alluded to or spoke directly about is that the team, if the team has been well put together beforehand, they will work together in the situation of great stress and strengthen each other as a result of it. And, and you know, the infectious disease team, the many doctors, I was just one of them involved in ICU care, all together. We covered each other when we were uh, needed. Uh, uh, we had other issues we had to do uh, besides being in the hospital and so forth. And then I think the most important thing which I think is a big under, uh, what's the word, a sort of understated thing is the, the families. We've heard about the families of the patients which who are incredibly important, but the families of the carers, of the nurses, the physiotherapists, the, the, the doctors who were behind those people, fearlessly, I would say, made it possible for us to do what we did and i think that, that there are a lot of unsung heroes in ho in, in the care healthcare workers homes and the frontline workers of all types whether they're mail delivery or working in hospitals or, or whatever that are really unsung heroes that allowed those people to go out because when i told my wife and children that i was going into the hospital with those risks they they didn't say you know no, no, you can't do that. That that's that's a big risk because you could come home and we all get infected. They that was the courage behind all of this that allowed us to practice the way that we did. Yeah, I can yeah, that's a very I agree, agree with your point immensely. I know I'd like to hear Paul's thoughts about the same too. Yeah, no, I, I see you can see uh, probably my wife Maya sitting in the background. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, she is a huge unsung hero of all of this. And I, I you know, so um, when all this started, I was, uh, I was, took some notes again too from my journal initially. And uh, the uh, originally it said, uh, having just come off service, meaning working in the ICU, I'm quarantining in the basement. And so at the beginning of all this, I went down and started living in our basement because we, again, just didn't know how infectious this was, even with wearing all of the protective equipment. And so uh, we felt like it was really important just to be as safe as possible. And, uh, and so, and then I uh, wrote a sentence here. I said, I haven't hugged my children in one, well over 10 days since I've been caring for patients with COVID-19. Um, and the uh, and what's funny about that is, is that I ended up quarantining for three months in the basement uh, without actually having any contact with my family. And, you know, it, it's uh, something too, where right, Maya was taking care of all of our children, our four yeah. kids throughout all of this. And you know, that's, I don't need to tell anybody who has children that that is just a, a ridiculous task. And so, uh, so that is, is huge. And I'm so grateful to everything that she did and how the kids uh, just persevered through all that as well. And I, I think, again, it's just, it's the power of the community, I think that is, is so huge. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, um, it, did you want to ask something, Jason? I can keep going for a minute if you want, or. I'll keep going, but I do have a question on the tip of my tongue, but you want to make, finish your point? No, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think otherwise, I, I think despite the fact that we were so um, had to distance then ultimately, you know, from people, I think in some ways, and I, you know, I don't know if everybody on the, the meeting had experienced this, there was such an opportunity for reconnecting also with for me it was colleagues and so we became very close again with the the group of people with whom I did my training who and those people are scattered all across the country and in part because of Maya helping to facilitate that we were really in contact quite a bit and sharing stories and and sharing experiences and actually sharing ways of, of treating patients 
And that was really powerful. And so I think that also uh, just provided a lot of strength, the, the, the a chance to understand that people were sharing similar experiences. And, um, and this idea that, um, you know, there was a, a finite period of time. And if I could just get through this, uh, that, you know, there would be light at some point at the end of the tunnel. And I think for me too, personally, I think there are a lot of practices that I use just to help in that. And, and some of those, I, I meditate on a daily basis, I journal. I really uh, work to, to try to take some time to uh, be able to uh, just be, work to be in the moment, which is so difficult to do with something like this pandemic. And I think those practices for me too have been very helpful. I, d I did, I, Jason, I just wanted to, Riff a little bit on the on fear, mm. and how how unhelpful fear is, and and how it can if organize, organizations can exacerbate fear, or they can basically eradicate fear through good organization and good open communication, good honest communication. And I think the fact that we were able to talk, as Paul was saying to our colleagues, and just say it as it was, what we were seeing, you know, if we didn't know exactly what to do, whether someone else could help us do that, it is, it's a lesson way beyond that time now, in terms of managing our fear in a way constructively, as opposed to, frankly, destructively, as you know, fear can work, you know, both ways in a way, you can channel it into positive constructive activity, or you can just dissemble. And I think the ICUs were a, were a picture of an assembly of people working together constructively to combat their own personal fear and the fear of their patients and the fear of the patients' families. And that that's a really important community activity uh, mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, and I, I hear so loud and clear the points that both of you are making about teamwork, working together, but the thing, and a shared purpose, but mm -hmm. I wanna go to a slightly different level about both of you and tell you something that I've thought about as I've got to know both of you, Paul I've known for a while, Mark, if you're a new friend, um, this concept that you are people with a purpose. And it's something that I was talking to Paul about yesterday. He's, he's a fan of Viktor Frankl, the, the philosopher who survived the Holocaust. And one of, one of many of his lessons was if you, if you have a purpose in life and a view of how your purpose in life is gonna drive you into the future, you really have you know, a lot of strength. That's where your source of strength. And I view both of you knowing your life stories now better today than I did a week ago, I view you two as people that have had a purpose that not just trained you to deal with fear and the medical challenges, but your entire life was aligned to deal with this last year, which I think is a lesson from all of us. Yeah, and I, I, and I think I, I think I've mentioned to, to you this before, but there is, it's a very strange purpose in medicine in a way. And uh, I, I was always reminded of this when, I don't know, Paul, whether you experienced this, but in, in British medical school, you started at the age of between 17 and a half and 18. You went straight to medical school from high school. And you went from, from high school straight to the anatomy dissecting room. Uh, so having never been exposed to death or cutting people up or anything, you just went from like, high school practicals dissecting flowers to like uh, the, the anatomy theater. And I remember after the first day, now there were 150 people in my medical school year. We came out of the anatomy theater and there were about four or five people on this, on this big Victorian staircase going down from it in tears going, I can't do this. I cannot, you know, weeping. These were 17 and a half and 18 year olds. I can't, I can't do this. And they, the, the following day, there were 145 members of the class, not 150. And it did make me think, what is it, like even at 18 or 17 what, that, that I was then, I was like, what is it about us of the 145 that can actually 
do this rather abnormal thing of being able to go in there and already have that purpose that you talked about ingrained in us that the purpose outweighed the fear, the horror, the nausea. I mean, by the end of the day, we were eating lunch in there. I mean, so that purpose stuff is sometimes talked up as a sort of a heroic thing. It, it, I always thought of it as sort of slightly abnormal, but <laughs> remarkable human trait more than a, you know, more than even a learned thing. It was just that you can adopt that way of working as a human and it, its purpose, it can be looked by others as purpose, but to yourself, it's just like, that's what I do. That, that is not a problem for me. And I actually thought the people who were weeping on the stairs were the normal ones. Mm -hmm. I thought, I didn't seem normal to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when I remember one, one of what my more sort of stoical colleagues went, oh, what's the matter with them? And I said, these guys are normal. We've just been in a room with 30 co corpses dissecting them under directions of these rather heartless surgeons. You know? yeah. And they were like, oh yeah, I guess so. We're abnormal and they're normal. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you know, what you're bringing up to Mark, I think is, is so important and being able to just, uh, for me, just to remember sometimes in the intensive care unit, particularly where our patients can't talk to us uh, just who they are as people is, is, can sometimes be really challenging. I think just like when you're dissecting a cadaver, let's say, and eating lunch. And I, I think that's a, a struggle, I think, too. And, and uh, just to share with people, too, there, there are tools that we use for that, actually, where uh, we actually have poster boards uh, that are up in patient rooms uh, called Get to Know Me posters, where we will have... Um, in, in the days when families could come in more regularly, and we'll talk about that maybe for a minute too, um, we would have them come and, and write on these boards about patients' favorite foods, movies, books, and put pictures of their families up. And it is such a simple thing that's so powerful because it, it's difficult sometimes to remember when you're just looking at a breathing machine and a, a dialysis machine and all these tubes and machines, what is really going on underneath all that. And, uh, and there's also bedside diaries that exist where staff will write in them to uh, record for patients uh, what's happened over their time in the intensive care unit because it is so difficult uh, for, you know, as, as Jim had said, don't have a lot of memories. And so I think being able to remember that can be really challenging. And uh, I think is, is just, it's, it's an ongoing challenge uh, for, for all of us, I think, who work in that kind of an environment. Um, and uh, I, I think what you were uh, talking about, Jason, too, and, and meaning and purpose, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I was uh, looking back as we were talking yesterday, too, through Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl and, and just some of the concepts that he talks about too. And, you know, as, as you know, uh, he survived a concentration camp and, and one of the comments he makes there is, is that, you know, that those people who survived um, were universally people who had purpose, who had meaning, who had a reason to fight for survival. And that even that didn't guarantee, of course, that you were gonna survive in that environment, but that without that, you could not survive. And I think that, you know, having that purpose, and, and I think it can be on many different levels in terms of, let's say, in medicine, the, just the practice of medicine, but also, of course, for, you know, one's family and, you know, uh, thinking personally for me, my wife, my children, you know, those, those kinds of, uh, of things that have meaning in our lives, I think, that allow us to be able to go through these difficult times and to try to come out the other end. So I, I think it, it's hugely impactful, and I think is, is, I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just say that, you know, having had many Lifesavers events now, the one thing that really uni unites and unifies all of the amazing people who have spoken to us on, in this series is this purpose in their life and the full alignment 
it's really one of the best lessons I've learned from all the speakers. And I want to thank you both for, again, hitting that home so hard. Mark, did you want to say something? I'm going to... yeah, I, did, I, I did want to talk about the other aspect of medicine as the appreciation of life and understanding life and the importance of life. And I think um, you, that, that this is the privilege of, you know, they talk about hospital privileges. And I think sometimes when you're a junior doctor, you just think privilege is some sort of legal term that you have this sort of privilege, a privilege, it's like a legal right to treat patients. Actually, it's a privilege to look after patients. You are taking their life in your hands and you're trying to restore them to full health again. That's actually an act of privilege that you're entitled to do that. I think that what Paul was alluding to in the ICU, which is the harder thing, is that you're doing that with a patient who cannot communicate to you that they, in a sense, themselves give you that uh, permission and privilege to look after them. My view from my training was that the fact that a patient came up to me and asked for me for help was a privilege to me, not to the patient and that's what hospital privileges mean that we we are asked but we have the privilege of patients asking us to look after us to look after them and i think that appreciation of protecting and looking after life as a privilege is is another hugely important thing that you learn as a doctor and any healthcare workers it's it, it's massive mm, yeah i appreciate that that's great Let's bring um, Jim back onto the screen for a moment. I'm gonna ask three of you two questions. We're gonna call this the lightning round. There we go. Don't tell CNBC I said that. Um, <laughs> in the last year, this is a question for all three of you. What belief or habit has most improved your life? Starting with Mark. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's that fundamental, you know, belief always that, that that to save, you know, to save one life, you save the world. I mean, this is a, a, a very important thing that every life to be saved is incredibly important. And mm -hmm. and that that every day in, in the hospital was, you know, the the in a way the battle that we were engaged in to be able to achieve that good goal, which is save every life intact that we possibly could. Yeah. Paul? It, it, it's funny, actually, too, that, uh, that Mark, that you say that, too, because I, I think I come at it in a way from a different perspective, which is, I guess, such an awareness of, of mortality and uh, the concept that um, and, and part of it may be too, that I, I work in an environment where so many people don't survive. And, uh, and so I think that um, for me, I think um, the maybe belief, the focus on the concept that the journey really is mm -hmm. all there is and that there uh, there really is ultimately no destination um, in a sense. And I think working to try to appreciate that, which is an ongoing challenge for me. And I think certain habits like meditation really help that for me. And it's probably been one of the most instrumental parts of, of just working to do that. But it, it's, um, I think that concept um, that it's the journey. And, and I think then, also, I think, um, and and maybe we can talk. Maybe even if uh, Kim's around too. But um, the, I think the importance of just human connection, and I think that's one thing that has been just so difficult. And I think we've tried ways around this uh, through, let's say, what we're doing tonight through Zoom, and uh, and I think though the importance of just physically and and in close proximity emotionally connecting to people i think has become really just a um for me just yeah. an insight and and the difficulties in for people who are sick in the hospital not having their families there yeah. 
has yeah. been crushing in so many different ways. And uh, so I, anyway, it's a couple of different answers. Sorry for the lengthy answer there, but. Um, yeah. No apologies necessary. Jim. <clears throat> yeah, so I think, you know, much like Paul, I think I kind of have two answers to that question. You know, obviously my experience over the last year has been a little bit different. Um, I mean, I think for me, it's a combination of, um, you know, things can always be worse. Um, and I think uh, also that, you know, you really, you know, you can't change the past, but you can control the future. And, you know, I, I got to be honest throughout this entire ordeal, you know, over the last year, it's been about a year now. Um, you know, I, I can't honestly, I don't, I can't remember a single time, even as early as being at Spalding, where I said to myself, you know, why me? Why did I get that sick? And, um, you know, maybe that's just the way that I'm wired. Um, and I think maybe I have some resilience in me, but I don't ever remember thinking to myself, why me? I remember thinking to myself, um, you know, much like we talked about fear, you know, fear is not an option here. Um, I have to, you know, you need to have a purpose. It's funny how we've come full circle on all of this, but you need to have a purpose. My purpose is my wife and my three kids, and now my two dogs, um, one of whom Paul may not know. I, we got a, a mini Bernadoodle who was born, uh, ironically, was born on March 26th, and about two days later is when I started to get better. Um, and that dog, Paul, is, uh, is Blake. So our, our mini Bernadoodle is named Blake. Oh, that's good. So for me, in any event, I, I, think, <clears throat> I think that's what it is. You know, you can't change the past, you can control the future. Um, play the cards that you're dealt, be resilient. Um, you know, I look at I, my daughter who's sitting next to me and, you know, I don't know whether I taught it to her or she taught it to me, but, you know, she was diagnosed with type one um, about three years ago and much like me. And I, I, th I think maybe I learned it from her. She's never once said, why me? She said, I'm going to be an elite soccer player. I'm going to teach younger kids what it's like to live with type one. And she's, she's done it all. So I think for me, it's all about being resilient and uh, you know, basically playing the cards that you're dealt. Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful thought. That, that's inspiring, I have to say. Yeah. And, and to hear you, Jim, say that you know things can always get worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, like very few people can actually uh, make a comment like that uh, and, uh, and, and have like pretty much it, it, as bad as it can be. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, but Paul, you know, that was the mindset, you know, the mindset. I remember when my daughter was diagnosed, my Kim and I sitting to children's when she had a blood sugar of above 500 in DKA or, you know, ketoacidosis. She doesn't have a brain injury. You know, she's going to recover. Things can always be worse. You know, think about how bad it could be. And, you know, that's just how we did our lives. You know, fortunately, we have some, some element of resilience in us. And uh, I'm tremendously grateful that you gave me the opportunity to be that way. Right. One more lightning round question. I want to remind everyone that they have a question to put it in the Q&A chat box. Um, okay, for our three speakers, is there some, if there was something you could convincingly tell all Americans, what would it be? Back to Mark. That vaccines are the most effective, cost-effective, safe approaches to preventing any form of of disease and in particular, in particularly, obviously infectious diseases. They've been around uh, for several hundred years. President George Washington, no less, vaccinated the Continental Army against smallpox because he realized that the, the, the virus that smallpox is would have killed more of his soldiers than the British ultimately would have. And the idea that we've had to relearn that now and we get concerns with anti-vaxxers and vaccine hesitancy, which can be understood, is something that we've got to convincingly understand is not correct, and that vaccines actually work and, are, and represent the way out of our current situation. Great. Paul? I, I guess I um, think back to uh, my, I had a teacher at the Harvard School of Public Health who uh, did surveys of, of the United States population about uh, political views. And I remember him saying, he said, isn't it amazing that all of the people in the red states think that the people in the blue states are absolutely crazy? 
And all the people in the blue states think all the people in the red states are absolutely crazy. Yeah. And those people really aren't any different. And so I think the one thing that I would hope um, that all Americans would do is to try to look for commonality amongst all of us and to try to uh, learn something about, to reach out and learn something about uh, each other, particularly those who have very different ideological beliefs to try to bring each other together. Because I have to say, I really am worried about the state of our country. And I, I think we need to find a way to bridge some of those gaps. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I'll stay apolitical um, and non-clinical in my answer and give you the perspective of um, somebody who uh, I guess had a near-death experience, right, Paul? Um, so I guess what I'll say is in circling back to what you know, Mark and Paul said earlier about there you know, not being any guarantees and no certainty, life is short. Uh, so live every day. Um, you know, I, um, you know, who knows whether I have immunity or not, but I mean, I still live my life very carefully and very responsibly. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to do that. And like Mark said, to get vaccinated. But listen, even in the midst of a pandemic, live life. And, you know, uh, I try to do that every day. I try to do it within the confines of COVID and make the most out of life every day. And uh, I don't sleep much because I do that, but I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, life is short. So make the most of it. Great. Um, before we go to q and I just want to bring it back to Mark to give us his scientist view of where are we going from here in the pandemic? Where are we going to be in six months and a year? Okay. <laughs> I, wish that was an, I wish that was an easier question than it sounds. Um, where are we going from here? So I, I just go back to the, the science that was at the very start of this on day one when we realized there was a coronavirus pandemic. Right from the get-go, we knew that, virus, that the coronavirus had the capacity to change. Uh, we, we weren't sure that a vaccine would actually be protective at that particular point. And we, we learned pretty rapidly that masks and social distancing definitely work extremely well as, as well as sort of hygiene measures and other public health measures. So as much as where we are six months on, the one thing we've at, or a year on and now going forward, we now know that vaccines can be protective and growing data from Israel, which in this sphere is a, you know, a light to the nations, is informing us that it's actually very effective uh, in these very large, you know, they've vaccinated 50% of the population. So we know now we're, now we're standing in beginning of March 2021, looking forward, we know we should remember all the things we learned, the masks, the social isolation, now the vaccines, and now we, we carry all of those forward for the next six months to a year as you know the data and the science informs us. There may be times when we can come back from the social isolation and, and even areas where we don't need to wear masks outside and stuff like that. But we must remember we're accumulating knowledge here, not just like, okay, now we've, we've got a vaccine, we can discard what we learned before about masks. And I think there will be things that are different in the next six months to a year. Um, and there will be th things that are actually the same because the virus is also changing with us. Uh, it's probing our weaknesses as it did right from the beginning. And it will continue to do that until we are able to get it back into the box that it came out of. And that's a no mean task, which will unlikely to be achieved in the next year, unfortunately. It will certainly be reduced in its impact, but not reduced to something that we can ignore and go back to the old normal. We will be in a new normal, but not the old normal. This, this is a question right from the Q&A uh, chat that I'm receiving that speaks to this. Is there anything you're seeing in the variants that makes you worried about the J&J, &J, the Moderna, and the Pfizer vaccines? Yes, of course. And th this is all science written several years ago about coronaviruses that they they not only probe and evade your own immune system they probe and evade the vaccine induced immune system as well and so 
Uh, that is that challenging. That means we have to update vaccines every year or maybe even you know every two years to respond to the way that nature is changing uh, and the nature of the coronavirus is changing over time. It is concerning, yes. But we have tools now in our armamentarium that we didn't have before to go up against that. Okay, there's a question um, I'll, I'll ask all of you, and this was um, it's a heartfelt question for Jim as well, which is um, what about, what tell us about long haulers and how, there's a part, part of the question is, is Jim a long hauler or are you fully recovered? Uh, I'm damn lucky. Uh, I, I am not, I, uh, I have nothing. I, it's, uh, it's truly a miracle. I have no long haul symptoms. Um, I, um, I run four miles. I skin up mountains and hike up mountains. I've had, you know, chest x-rays and pulmonary function tests that are all normal. So for some reason, and who knows why I uh, somehow managed to escape this thing with really no long haul symptoms whatsoever. Right. I, I would, uh, I would just add that when, you know, in previous pandemics, we have learned, like in the HIV pandemic, we learned as we were going on what the disease consisted of. Obviously, we're only a year, into, a year or a little bit more than that, into a, a new disease in humans. And there's no doubt, I mean, it's Paul, our colleagues, you know, Leo Gins uh, and so forth in the pulmonology department are caring for patients who have a long COVID type syndrome. So I think the biggest and most important thing that we can do as doctors and healthcare workers is recognize a new condition emerging and be responsive to our patients in a empathic manner because we're learning about long COVID as fast as they are learning about long COVID in that regard. I, I'm interested to know what you think, Paul, because you're also, aware of these sort of aspects yeah i i think you know you're right it, it definitely exists as a syndrome and i've certainly seen patients as well who have really persistent symptoms of all different kinds either respiratory or, or sometimes even neuropsychiatric symptoms um, where they don't think properly um, and the uh and I think we are all learning about this. And I think um, one of the learning points for me is always just being humble in terms of our understanding of, of any process like this. I think there's a tendency sometimes for all of us to, uh, when we hear about certain symptoms that don't fit neatly into a, a box that we understand medically, to sometimes write those off as just being like, uh, it's just, you know, in somebody's head. And I think that may be true or it may not be. And either way, it's no less real. And I think um, for us to all really just work to try to understand that and why those ha uh, symptoms happen, I think is really important. And, and yes, so there is a post COVID clinic at Mass General. And if anybody is experiencing, you know, people who are experiencing symptoms like that, and then it's a great place to try to get help. And there are treatments that are seeming to help some of those symptoms. Okay, we're gonna, there's a final question before I thank our speakers. I wanna, this is an important question for a lot of people. Should pregnant women be vaccinated and when will children be able to be vaccinated? So pregnant women should definitely be vaccinated. There's no, you know, there are no CDC guide, guidelines that say that pregnant women can't be vaccinated. But what, what happens there is what's called a sort of joint decision making between the obstetrics team and the parents to be, to be that it's, it's, it, can, it should be discussed so that everyone is comfortable with the decision around vaccination. So they've not been, again, Israel's a great example, large number of people vaccinated, including a, a, a good proportion of pregnant women they have not seen any uh, safety signal in that context. And it's always worth bearing in mind. And Paul, you probably saw this. I, I, I don't know whether the ICU covers pregnant women who developed severe COVID, but there was certainly a number of severely ill pregnant women with COVID. And that is the 
issue here that if the if the vaccines prevent severe and moderately severe disease, then that could be very impactful in protecting the health of pregnant women. Great. Well, I, I have to do this at the end of every program and say, I'm sorry, we have to end because we could go on all night with speakers of the caliber of you people here tonight. Thank you so much to Mark, Paul and Jim for your willingness to share your personal story, the story behind the story, which is what we always look for at Lifesavers. I think tonight, everyone got us an incredible uh, lesson and life lessons, uh, respect for caregivers, uh, respect for scientists, and so many things that uh, we're gonna take away from this evening. Courage, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Everyone have a great night. See you at the next Lifesavers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.